Good morning, everyone. Let's call the California Broadband Council meeting to order. I am Leanna Bailey Crimmins, Director of the Department of Technology and the new Broadband Council Chair. Over the past six months, Chief Deputy Russ Nichols has served as an acting director and chair, and I want to personally thank him for his leadership and partnership during the transition. In May, the council discussed the broadband action plan and the focus was short-term action items. Today, the focus will be on the long-term action items, which means those action items that are going to take more than just a few years to complete. This council, council has made significant progress um, on these efforts, and we all look forward to uh, hearing about these achievements today. With that, Ms. Stein, will you please call the roll call? Certainly. Good morning. Director Bailey Crimmins? Here. Ms. Smith? Commissioner Helk? Here. Mr. Green? Here. Mr. Below? Here. Mr. Jameson? Present. Ms. Pepper? Present. Ms. McPeak? Present. Mr. Flores? Here. Mr. Chisholm? Here. Ms. Snyder? Here. Uh, oh, Dr. Williams? Present. A few housekeeping items before we begin. There is time at the end of the meeting dedicated to public comment. Presenters, please cue Cole to advance your slides. All committee members, please raise your hand to speak. The chair calling on you helps ensure you are heard. Madam Chair, we do have a quorum. Thank you, Jules. Um, the first agenda item we have is the State Broadband and Digital Literacy Update, Mr. Scott Adams. Thank you, Director Bailey Kremens, and good morning, council members and members of the public. My name is Scott Adams, and I'm the Deputy Director of Broadband and Digital Literacy. I want to thank you for the opportunity to provide you um, with an update on our work today. Um, as was noted uh, by Director Bailey Crimmins, we have a full agenda today, so my comments will be brief. Um, next slide, please. Uh, <laughs> what I wanted to draw your attention to is that since our last meeting, our office has been um, at work executing the Broadband Action Plan implementation work plan that was approved by the Broadband Council. Um, and has been conducting monthly working sections with the Broadband Action Plan um, item owners. Um, as Director Bailey Kremens has noted, there has been significant <laughs> progress on these long-term action items, and you will hear um, about those in our next agenda item. Um, there are a couple of significant highlights that we wanted to draw your attention to that will <coughs> also be discussed in future or, or in later agenda items, but we wanted to flag these for the council members and the members of the public. Um, the first is related to um, the FCC's affordable connectivity program. Um, California has made significant progress in both promotion of the affordable connectivity program and household enrollment in the FCC's uh, program, which provides a monthly internet service subsidy to residents to support um, affordability of home internet service and increase broadband adoption rates. This is the result of the work of many of the broadband council members and state agency partners, including CDT, the Public Utilities Commission, the Department of Education, the state libraries, the Department of Aging, um, and also <laughs> particularly the California Emerging Technology Fund. You will hear uh, much more about the exciting news on enrollment and some uh, future plans ahead from um, Sunny McPeak and CETF and the, their update later on. Um, another key highlight I wanted to share with you is that um, <clears throat> as part of the council's efforts to um, engage with critical partners and stakeholders and provide technical assistance that we did conduct a, a tribal digital equity planning grant workshop with um, the Office of Tribal Affairs and uh, thank you, Secretary Snyder. Um, the California Emerging Technology Fund and the National Telecommunications Information Administration. Um, the intent of this workshop was to support tribes in seeking funds to develop their own digital equity plans, which would be developed in concert with the state's digital equity plan. And 
Lastly, um, just wanted to flag that as we've been reporting out on the NTIA um, Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act programs, which will be critical to the state in um, receiving funding to support implementation of the Broadband for All program and its various digital equity initiatives that um, CDT has submitted the state's digital equity planning grant application to the NTIA earlier this month. And again, we'll share more details about that uh, in a later agenda item in today's meeting. Um, I wanna thank you, that concludes my report and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Adams. Um, do any of the council members have questions for Scott? I, Jules, just to let you know, I only see Scott Adams on the screen. So if there is anybody raising their hands, <laughs> you just let me know. All right, with that, we'll go ahead and go to the second agenda item, which is the California Public um, Utilities Commission, Mr. Rob Osborne. Good morning. I'm not sure if you can see me. Yes, we can. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you for allowing me to provide an update on the CPC's action items from the Broadband Action Plan. I'm Robert Osborne, Director of the Communications Division at the California Public Utilities Commission. The first item, which is um, action item number three, modernize California's universal service programs. The status of this, if you go to the next slide, status of this is continuing. Um, there have been many updates across the various programs, so I'll highlight a few. On the California Advanced Services Fund, there have been major updates to a suite of broadband grant programs in the ongoing rulemaking, which is listed on this slide, uh, R20-08021. This includes new opportunities to apply for adoption, public housing, and consortium grants. For the July 1st this year, public housing and adoption accounts application cycle, we received applications for 19 projects for public housing for a total of one point, almost 1.4 million. For the adoption account applications, uh, we received applications for 99 projects requesting a total of 28.5 million, which exceeds the uh, allocation budget we set, which was 20.024 million. So we'll be going through those applications in the coming months. Um, on the local agency technical assistance uh, applications, um, we are planning to open the window for that in August 1st. And that is also under the California Advanced Services Fund PU code 281. For Lifeline, uh, we recently completed an assessment and we are also in the process of uh, vendor procurement for a TPA third-party administrator transition, which includes some modernization of the Lifeline program. On the high cost fund, uh, we're in the process of a cost of capital consideration, as well as uh, modernizing the broadband elements of uh, high cost fund. Uh, and then on surcharges, we have an open rulemaking currently on modernizing how we calculate the public purpose program surcharges and how providers will remit those surcharges. And we're targeting first quarter of 2023 for implementation. Please go on to the next slide. Thank you. So on action item 10, which is establishing clear standards of consumer protection and provisioning of equitable service by providers, Next slide, please. Status of this is continuing. So highlighting a few activities relevant to these uh, rulemakings. Protections for consumers impacted by disasters, resiliency requirements. This was under uh, our rulemaking 1803011. There's substantial compliance on the um, battery backup, power backup and resiliency for both wireline and wireless providers, but we're still not there yet with regard to complete um, compliance. And we're working with those providers now and determining areas where uh, there still needs to be some supplement. Um, on service quality standards, we opened a new rulemaking, R2203016. And this is looking at service quality standards and uh, compliance for those service quality standards, including things such as out of service um, interval um, the degree to which we have compliance from providers who are offering service to customers for telephone service, 
um, repairing those outages within a 24 hour period. That's one of the several um, metrics that we measure and enforce. Um, on the digital redlining, uh, we have that included in one of the phases of the broadband for all rulemaking, which is R20-09001. The preceding goal really was to set out the strategic direction to ex expeditiously deploy reliable, fast, and affordable broadband that connects all Californians. The keyword there is all. Um, we've been meeting with Cal advocates and also looking at various redlining studies that have been done in the past. Um, in fact, so the city of Sacramento last year uh, published a, 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 a report entitled Race and Place in Sacramento that looked at redlining. Um, we're also considering um, what definition would be appropriate for redlining. I think focusing more on the state of where things are today and how to uh, cure those, those problems. Um, so we're in the process now, given uh, this transition um, from a census block based broadband mapping to location based broadband mapping. This will allow us to do a deeper dive into the deployment and adoption of broadband across the state. So stay tuned for more on that. Next slide, please. So improving the California Lifeline program. Next slide, please. Status of this is continuing. Um, a number of things have been happening on this front. So we've updated the support amounts and standards uh, for the California portion of Lifeline support that goes to providers. Um, and that increases the amount of broadband data that uh, the California Lifeline program offers. Uh, we've reformed the renewals process in compliance with AB 74. So we've streamlined the procedures for participants to renew their participation in the program. And in addition, while not directly related to AB 74, uh, the Lifeline program has expanded the identification verification that makes it easier for parolees uh, or parolees, people who will be going on parole, to participate, to enroll in the Lifeline program. Um, on Lifeline program assessment and evaluation, this was issued as a ruling in May. We've put that out for comment. Um, we. Um, it's a pretty wide ranging assessment of the program and we're in the beginning stages of implementing program reforms. Um, we have the assessment available on our website and I can provide that link afterwards. Um, and commission staff presented this assessment, um, the summary of that to the administrative committee that oversees the Lifeline program. And the re full report, as I said, is available online. Finally, um, we're addressing the additional federal support, and this isn't a proposed decision. We're considering rules for how the program should address additional federal support offered by the Affordable Connectivity Program. Next slide, please. So action item 17, next slide, please. Technical assistance for tribes and local governments. The status of this is continuing. The commission continues to provide both formal and informal guidance to local agencies and tribes regarding broadband solutions in their areas. In 2020, the commission adopted rules for a tribal technical assistance program to re reimburse tribes for pre-project costs related to network deployment. In April of this year, the commission adopted an expanded program that it provides support to local agencies as well as tribes. We call this the local agency technical assistance. And as I mentioned earlier, we are planning to open the application window for these grants in August. Informally, and in addition to participating in the California Department of Technology roundtables earlier this year, um, the commission staff and commissioners and advisors regularly meet with local agencies to discuss broadband network deployment. And I believe Commissioner Halk will provide more details on that in her update. The commission also has a tribal consultation policy under which tribes may request government to government meetings with commission with the commission to discuss broadband and other utility issues. And we have dedicated staff that have extensive experience with federal and state funding opportunities for tribes and we make ourselves available to advise tribes as needed. This concludes my updates on the CPC action items. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Osborne. Um, do any of the council members have questions for Rob? I see, um, Ms. McPeak, you have a question? I do, um, Chair, Director Bailey Crimmins, uh, welcome. Thank you very much for calling on me. Uh, thank you, Rob, for that presentation. Um, I'm actually wanting to congratulate 
you and your staff for being so responsive when we did workshops in, um, in June so people could get their applications into the CPUC by July 1. And I was just wondering, and I also want to acknowledge that Commissioner Huff actually increased in the final decision, the amount of funding into the adoption account and the public housing account. Could you just review, maybe I missed how many applications you received for the adoption account and for the public housing account? I heard the number, the total number of applicate, you know, of requested grants, which far exceeds what is available. But I'm wondering um, if you have the number of applications for those two accounts. Yes, for public housing uh, was 19 project applications for a total of 1.4 million. And okay. for adoption was 99 projects for a total of 28.5 million. Thank you. Thank you again for repeating that for me. I appreciate again your staff being so responsive and helping. And the technical assistance really makes a difference that we have helped uh, along with your staff out to the out, out to the applicants. And I further commit to you and Commissioner Hauk on the public housing uh, side to get a lot more uh, of the housing, publicly subsidized housing organizations to apply. Thank you, Ms. Wright Mitpeak. Any other questions for Mr. Osborne? Okay, we'll go ahead and go on to the next uh, presenter, which is for the Department of General Services, Jason Kenney. Hey everybody, how you doing? Um, Jason Kenney, DGS, Deputy Director for Real Estate, uh, here to give an action item update on uh, item seven, identifying uh, state property for possible use for broadband infrastructure. Uh, next slide, please. So um, just as a, the briefest of recaps, uh, as we've reported out in previous broadband council meetings, um, you know, the initial step that we took in conjunction with uh, CDT and uh, PUC was to take a look at the uh, universe of state property. DGS has a GIS enabled database that's public that shows all state owned property with few exceptions. Um, and then align that to the middle mile network uh, using a, a proximity as the primary uh, uh, variable. And you know that came up with the, we'll call it the, the most maximum universe of potential state uh, properties that uh, could be leveraged or utilized uh, for the middle mile network. Um, beyond that, we've been working with uh, with our partners to see if we could identify maybe a, a bit more granular criteria um, and you know cross reference that with what we actually have um, on record uh, without having to spend millions doing uh, you know infrastructure deep dives and uh, you know so some of the uh, the request for information uh, we had others we didn't but we were able to sort of uh, update the map um, and both uh, you know our our GIS folks and CDT's GIS folks have um, created a an updated map that uh, represents maybe a slightly slimmed down, but still uh, what we're calling the maximum universe of uh, state property that has an alignment or a potential use for the middle mile network. Next slide. Um, it, to, uh, to advance the action item though, I mean, simply saying that these properties are close to and could be used is probably not sufficient. Um, and so we've done a number of uh, industry presentations, both of those uh, listed there, the Broadband for All Roundtable, um, and the broadband industry meeting. Um, we did those presentations to highlight the fact that there is state property uh, that is potentially available, um, you know, locational alignment, those sorts of things. Um, and uh, we followed up those meetings with a survey. What we were really looking for is to try to gauge not just general interest in using state property, but also um, perceived barriers and then the specific development framework, you know, or would most entities say, look, I just want ground to bury conduit in. I want to put an antenna on a building. Like what, what would the, you know, I want to build a 40 story tower. Like what is the, sorry, um, 40 foot tower. What is the, what is the general gist of the use of state property? Because all of that will impact how we select property. If we have property that actually works, um, the uh, transactional authority, the leasing authority that we would use, the whole nine yards. So we, you know, we were kind of craving input. Next slide, please. Um, we did get results from the survey. They were somewhat limited. Um, so we had 14 responses out of 152 uh, ISPs who were the subject of the survey. 
um, that could indicate a uh, you know potentially diminished interest in state property, or it could just be that folks got busy. Um, so um, really quickly, I'll cover just the anecdotal results and then kind of next steps. But anecdotally, um, we we got back kind of what we suspected um, that uh, there was definitely interest in a lot of uh, you know rooftop um, uh, uh, improvements. You know, putting antennas on roofs, that sort of thing, or the erection of um, larger scale towers. Um, generally speaking, the survey indicated that folks were looking at long term leasing uh, models, um, you know, at, you know, essentially far less than fair market value, um, and that they would need to be some sort of uh, a permanent site access, 24 site, uh, 7 access to the sites. Um, so that they could come in and do whatever repairs, upgrades, whatever they needed to do unimpeded. Um, without interference. Um, and then one of the questions we asked kind of more generically was what kind of barriers they foresaw uh, in, in doing this. Um, and as expected, you know, cost permitting and just speed to execution were kind of the, uh, the general uh, concerns raised. Next slide. So since we didn't get, um, you know, really a great sample size, um, we are, uh, CDT, I should say, is uh, resending the survey to see if we can get additional feedback. Um, we hope that we'll get a larger pool or at least increase our pool, but we don't expect necessarily to get materially different responses um, from the survey, which is meant to be sort of a, an introductory pass at this. Um, and so at the close of this, um, you know, uh, subsequent resending of the survey, um, our plan is to uh, do a, a random selection and schedule more in-depth interviews with some of the respondents to tease out some of the concepts, to talk a little bit more about state property in general. Um, because again, you know, if we're going to use state property in this way, we would need to have, you know, property specific solicitations. We have to have many, many conversations with the departments who actually have jurisdiction over those properties about encumbrances and uses. And since the state has tens of thousands of properties and tens of thousands of buildings, um, it is uh, you know, pretty impossible to sort of talk about all of that uh, without a little more specificity. Um, so those interviews, I think, are going to be really useful in either helping us say that, yes, this concept is viable and he here's a targeted way to go do it, or to say that right now there doesn't appear to be interest in state property and we should uh, put this on the shelf until that changes. Um, the other thing, though, that I think is is particularly useful to highlight is, um, you know, our um, these interviews are also going to probably tease out just the um, the specific transactional path that we want to follow. So our the, the state's authority to lease property is a creature of statute. Um, most departments don't have any authority to lease their own property out. It all runs through DGS, and DGS has a variety of leasing authorities. Um, but they are either very generic or they're specific to a purpose. And the generic ones tend to have restrictions on either duration or fair market value, those sorts of things. Um, and so these surveys will let us know if there might need to be some sort of legislative tweak uh, to facilitate broadband deployment on state properties more broadly. Um, so that's where we're at um, and kind of uh, where we're headed next, but I'm happy to uh, answer any questions that the council may have. Thank you, Mr. Kenny. Um, does any of the council members have questions for Jason? I see uh, Ms. Wright McPeak. Thank you, Jason. I'm, um, I appreciate the effort and I'm not um, surprised by the initial response, although as you just said, it raises the awareness. So my question is, as particularly regional broadband consortia are working with uh, prospective partners on last mile deployment and looking at projects, developing projects, and they're in that phase now, how should they interact with you on where there might be state properties along the path of deployment? That's a great question. So, um, and, and maybe if I can get on a soapbox for 10 seconds, I promise it won't take long. Um, you know, I think your question kind of teases out sort of the difference between that and what we're doing here. So what we've been focusing on is sort of taking this proactive, holistic look, where can we find alignment? Where can we get stuff out to entice people to come in? Um, that is very different, I think, um, than folks who uh, are, are, are currently working on an effort and, and need to cite something um, and so th those don't happen necessarily, you know, they don't have to wait for our, our survey, they don't have to wait for our, our uh, investigatory results, those sorts of things. Um, I would happily, you know, uh, tell anybody who's willing to listen, 
we have a website. The website lists every single piece of state property. It's a GIS enabled database. You can literally search by county, Senate and assembly district, uh, city. You can draw lines and see all property in a certain area. Whatever you want to do, um, it's a it's a really robust um, Esri back database. Um, and so if some provider out there needs to deploy and they look at that and they say, hey, there's a piece of property here. DGS is happy to take that, go liaise with the department who has jurisdiction over it, see if there's any issues. I mean, it could be a wildlife corridor or something that would obviously make it completely unusable, mm -hmm. but we're happy to go do that and see if there's a deal to be made. Um, we would probably have to put that out to solicitation, but I would also imagine that that entity um, would have a, a pretty competitive you know, leg up in, in, in winning it. Um, it would just be fair and unbiased on our part. Um, but it would be absolutely something that we'd be happy to facilitate that to see if we can, you know, help those those last mile deployments as well. Great. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Mr. Jameson. Thank you, um, Jason. I just I just really want to commend you, the CDT team, the CPUC team for for putting this uh, getting us to this point. It seems like this is a topic that we've been talking about for some time kind of conceptually. And it's really nice to see us making progress and, and kind of getting to that point where there may be some some possibilities, albeit you've got a big map and a low number of respondents. But that's um, that's actually one of the things I wanted to ask about was of the respondents, um, I think you said there was 14 out of 150, if I remember correctly, give or take, was there any commonality among those respondents, You know, whether it be geographically, size, was there anything that we could kind of glean from that to think about who we might want to further target since they clearly had some level of interest? Yeah, I want to um, see if our, our CDT partners want to want to add. But from from my review of the respondents, um, it it seemed to be a pretty, you know, decent sampling size. Um, you had some big entities and small entities. Um, I didn't catch anything that was geographic. I'm not sure that we necessarily had that as a, a, a demographic question at the beginning of the survey, if memory serves. But it seemed to be. I mean, at the 14, it it wasn't like you know just the biggies um, or just some small regional folks. It seemed to be a, a decent cross-section. Okay, good. And, and then the other th only other thing I wanted to ask was, and going back to kind of the leasing authority issue, and that's something you and I have long talked about as kind of the second pillar of this, of solving for this problem. Um, I would just say that I'm a bit concerned that we're, you know, you, you use the term teasing out, which is a great, you know, it's a great phrase, right? We're really, it's almost a needle in a haystack effort, right? You're really trying to marry that perfect state property with that perfect ISP business need. I'm a little concerned that we're going to finally get to that point, but realize that, and as we know, 10 years is, you know, hardly enough for particularly small ISPs to make ROI. Um, and then the moment we find out we need legislation, you know, we could be looking at another, you know, 12 months before getting there. So it'll be really good to get that, your follow-up on your surveys done and accomplished and maybe give us that direction as to whether we really do need that authority or not. Yeah, it's a really good flag, and and I agree, it is a, an important uh, element of it. I, I I'm I'm going to go on a limb and predict that you know, insofar as folks say they want towers, um, we need an authority uh, change. I think that's going to be just a uh, an easy statement to make here. If they're talking about you know putting antennas on buildings, um, that we could probably probably facilitate fairly simply. Um, the other thing is there are existing communications towers. A lot of the ones that the state administers are for emergency purposes, but there are, you know, CHP, CAL FIRE, OES, quite a few towers throughout the state that we have a telecom leasing program that uh, includes letting private entities, um, so long as there's no conflict, you know, such lease out space on those towers. So there, there, there are things where we could probably uh, move the needle um, now while an authority change is pending, but Yes, and so far as someone comes back and says, we want to put you know, 40 foot towers on state property uh, for 99 years um, at less than fair market value, that will almost certainly require um, a transactional change in authority for us. Thank you. Mr. Flores. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I'm just wondering if uh, you have, uh, if you've thought about the fair system, you know, they're, quite large entities throughout the state. I would say some are pretty strategically located. If there's a, a single purpose or that you might have in mind for those properties. 
Yeah. Um, so, I mean, DGS obviously, well, not, you know, obviously, we don't we don't have authority to dictate what happens to properties under the jurisdiction of other departments. Um, and so, you know, we kind of have this clearinghouse role and transactional authority. But typically, we we work on behalf of of clients. Um, the fairgrounds are absolutely part of our property inventory. They're absolutely part of our search. Um, and historically, um, you know, there's a lot that's done with those, both from a you know, fair purpose, but also for non-fair purposes, emergencies. I mean, a lot happened in the pandemic as well. Um, and so those conversations um, would need to occur through the actual district agricultural associations, the boards who have jurisdiction over those properties. Um, they would actually have to, sure. you know, fully on board. But um, going back to, um, you know, uh, Miss Miss Peak's comments. Um, you know, if if a last mile provider, you know, uh, 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 needed to to put something on their property, we could facilitate that. Um, and certainly, in this middle mile alignment, um, their properties are included in the mix. Right. Well, I, I can I can tell you that the uh, the the uh, the boards themselves are are pretty anxious to help in any way they possibly can. So uh, you'll have their full cooperation. Um, and anything we can do to help, uh, obviously, we want to be there for you. Of course, of course, yeah. I just don't want to speak for them, but yeah, I, I fully, I fully expect the same. This is something that state government, I'm sure, is going to lean into. Thank you. All right, Mr. Kenny, I do not see any other questions, so we'll go ahead and go to the next agenda item. Great job. Thank you. Um, Department of Housing and Community Development, Sarah Poss. Hi. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Perfect. Thank you. Um, good morning. My name is Sarah Poss. Um, I'm with the Department of Housing and Community Development um, Unit Chief over Policy and Program Support. I'm here to give a very brief update on action item number 13, which is the sole uh, action item that HCD is in the lead for in the action plan. Um, so our action item is to leverage <clears throat> existing HCD programs such as the infill infrastructure grant um, and the affordable housing and sustainable communities um, program. And um, next slide. I uh, just wanted to give a quick overview uh, of AB 434, um, which is our su super NOFA program, um, notice of funding application program. Um, and our infill infrastructure grant program falls under that um, sort of suite of programs um, that allows for a coordinated single application, um, which allows um, for our stakeholders and for HCD, HCD to align eligibility criteria, scoring, um, and release of funds. So really just kind of helps streamline the process. Next slide. Um, so uh, to give you an idea of where we are in the process, um, applications for the super, Supernova were due earlier this month and awards are scheduled for later this year. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about what these programs did to satisfy the criteria set forth in the action item. Um, so uh, to talk about first eligible expenses, broadband is now an eligible expense um, under all, of, all four of these programs. Um, and it's a threshold requirement to receive funding. So um, the speed has to meet the, the minimum federal requirement of 25.3, um, 25 megabits per second for download, three megabits per second for upload. Um, and then we've also added um, certain point scoring criteria if uh, projects meet um, the following criteria um, on the slide. I won't go through all of it because um, all of this information is available on our website, but um, we're giving the opportunity to go above and beyond um, just the minimum uh, standard and, and really make sure that um, there's a robust broad, broadband capability um, under all four of these programs. Um, next slide. Um, moving on to um, the Affordable Housing and Sustainable Communities Grant. Uh, this grant uh, for background is administered by the Strategic Growth Council and it's implemented by HCD. We're uh, currently in round six of uh, funding. Um, the award date was earlier this year in January. Um, round seven is available. Uh, the NOFA is available on our website for public comment right now. Um, so uh, we have a proposed round seven. Um, again, it's up for public comment, so uh, it hasn't been completed yet. But I wanted to talk a little bit about um, the characteristics of the uh, eligible expenses and threshold requirement um, for ASIC. 
um, for round six and seven. So um, in, in both rounds six and seven, broadband infrastructure is an eligible expense. Um, and we've proposed for round seven um, that broadband service uh, be offered as an eligible expense. Um, for round seven, we've also pr uh, proposed that digital literacy programs uh, be an eligible expense. Um, and then the threshold program and uh, for the threshold requirement in round six, as I mentioned, um, you know, same for AB 434 programs, it's 25-3. Um, for round seven, uh, we've proposed that um, applicants uh, are required to provide broadband service at no additional cost to the tenant. So um, we've we've met the recommendations of this action item and we're continuing to build upon them um, and uh, and make sure we've got a more robust offering in our grant programs for these broadband considerations. Um, and that's that's the conclusion of my presentation. I promised you would be brief, um, but happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Poss. Does any of the uh, council members have questions? And I, I see uh, Ms. Wright McPeak, um, you, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Sarah, thank you very much for that um, really uh, uh, encouraging and, and, and positive approach that HCD is taking. HCD is always had a very big place in my heart. Um, my question is, do you think most of the people that are applying for the for the programs, particularly the uh, sustainable communities, affordable housing and sustainable communities grants are aware of the California Advanced Services Fund public housing account. Now most are, uh, new construction is a lot different than retrofitting and the legacy uh, properties, but many of the applicants I think uh, are actually have a multitude of properties. So they've got legacy properties as well as new properties. Just what, what is your thought there? And then what else would you advise us we could do to coordinate on getting the word out around the, the uh, California Advanced Services Fund public housing account? Um, Ms. McPeak, um, thank you so much for the question. Um, in full transparency, this is uh, my second month at HCD. So I am still learning about our programs. I can't claim any of the credit for the amazing work that's been done with these programs. Um, so, uh, so I have to uh, tell you, I, I, I don't know how to speak to your first question, but I'd be absolutely happy to um, follow up in writing and get that to the, the council and get it to you. Um, and then as far as continuing to coordinate, um, I think that the, the, the infrastructure that um, the council provides in coordinating and the action plan um, that's been provided, um, it has been very valuable in helping HCD make, you know, make sure that we're in alignment with the administration. Um, we're working with uh, other departments and agencies to make sure that we're, we're meeting the goals of, of the action plan. Um, so I think continued coordination um, is just the key and, um, and thank you for the question. I see no uh, other council member questions. So thank you very much, Ms. Poss. I um, look forward to seeing you again next month. Um, our next agenda item uh, is from the Department of Technology, Scott Adams. You have four action items that you're gonna be updating the council on. So I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. Thank you, Director Bailey Crimmins. And I'm um, glad to be back here. Uh, CDT will be presenting on um, four action items. Um, the first of which is action item 14, um, <clears throat> which is to promote existing state contractual vehicles um, with, um, you know, internet service providers and equipment vendors to support cost savings and efficient purchasing of broadband services and equipment by local public entities. This is a much broader action item. Um, uh, so there's other areas that we've been um, you know, exploring and leveraging besides just what's shown here on the screen. If you could advance the next slide, please. Um, as far as the progress that we anticipate, you know, this is a long-term item. This will be continuing and ongoing. Um, some of the highlights uh, we want to report out here, though, is that we have been able to leverage um, existing um, procurements and contracts for the Middle Mile Broadband um, Initiative, which you'll hear a little bit about later um, with Deputy Director Monroe's presentation, but um, in terms of next steps, we really think there's a potential opportunity that we can further um, explore in, in the, both the development of the state digital equity you know, 
plan and also the aligned bead planning efforts with the Public Utilities Commission. Next slide. Uh, the next is action item 16, which again, these are summarized um, summaries of the action item language, but partner with existing internet service providers to promote, track, and publicly report progress of adoption of affordable internet services and devices throughout the state. Um, next slide. Again, <clears throat> this is a long-term item and it's gonna be ongoing and require continued building a partnership of, of multiple entities. Um, but we do want to flag that, um, you know, the most significant way that we're moving forward on promoting low cost uh, service and device offers is through the broadband for all portal. Um, as we had shared in um, past meetings, um, <clears throat> the Department of Technology has partnered with the California Emerging Technology Fund and everyone on to create um, an a, affordable uh, service and device offer uh, locator by zip code. Um, for both organizations and individuals to um, access uh, low cost service plans. And you can see um, two images here of, of what is on the portal. Um, the first is the zip code finder. And then um, the second image on the right shows um, just the, a brief summary of what comes up. And you can see um, part of the state's strategy is to couple the affordable connectivity plan with existing private sector low cost offers. You see two of those here. Um, if we were to extend out the, um, this image, you would see there's also some affordable device offers that um, show up on the, on the tool. So we uh, continue to build this out. Um, next slide, please. Also in terms of um, you know, tracking um, adoption rates, um, you know, and, and enrollment in subsidies. Uh, as we reported out in our last meeting, we've also fully integrated, a, a, you know, a resource page and a tracking system for the state's, um, you know, enrollment and connection in the affordable connectivity program. This again um, was a joint effort that was done in partnership with the California Emerging Technology Fund and CSU Chico. Um, we uh, you know, have created a system where we can get live updates on um, both uh, you know, the percentage and number of state households participating in the um, affordable connectivity program. And then um, what the second image shows is that there is a, a searchable function uh, both by county and zip code um, to show uh, enrollment percentages and you know, uh, you know, by county and by zip code. Um, so we um, look forward to hearing more about this in uh, Ms. McWright uh, Peak's presentation later on. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, action item 18 um, really refers to developing and managing a multi-layered network of digital inclusion stakeholders to discuss ongoing needs, share resources, and coordinate initiatives. Next slide. This will... Um, <laughs> continue to be a long-term action item and ongoing. Um, we do want to report that in the last um, several months that we, um, CDT and other broadband council member, um, you know, partners have engaged with over 1,000 local and tribal governments, broadband consortia, metropolitan planning organizations, schools, libraries, nonprofits, and internet service providers. And those have been done via a variety of means and <laughs> both meetings and consultations, the broadband for all roundtables, and um, attending external meetings and conferences. Um, next slide. Uh, in terms of next steps, we, we'll just committed to continue to expand our network and areas of engagement, and those will include um, establishing regular subject matter convenings, um, for instance, on broadband adoption and digital literacy and digital equity. Um, hosting uh, regular broadband for all roundtables with uh, broadband council members and partners, um, you know, establishing digital equity and, and joint bead planning events, um, you know, providing monthly electronic updates and really utilizing the broadband for all portal, which was called out in the action plan as being a central repository of information for the state's broadband for all efforts and using that as a um, as a web presence to communicate and update information with, um, you know, the universe of stakeholders and partners. Next slide, please. 
So the last item we will report on is action item 24. Um, again, <laughs> that's the last item in the action plan. And it uh, requests that executive branch entities and constitutional agencies incorporate broadband into their strategic plans. Next slide. Um, again, this is a uh, long-term item that is ongoing. Um, wanted to report the progress that we have made thus far is we uh, have put together a, a, a survey and sent it out to 132 entities. Um, some of the, the folks we've reached out to were um, agency and department chief information officers, broadband council members, um, you know, agencies and departments, and then action item leads. Um, <coughs> we have um, also conducted individual outreach. Um, thus far, we've received uh, a relatively limited um, response back, but it, it's, a, it's a decent sample size of about um, 31 folks. Um, next slide. Just some highlights we wanted to um, share with the council to give you a sense of what um, we're finding here. Um, there, these are five examples. So the Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation um, obviously reports that they're deploying broadband to prisons in support of rehabilitative efforts for incarcerated persons. The <coughs> Labor and Workforce Development Agency is um, developing a workforce literacy program um, that will include digital literacy. Um, the Department of Parks and Recs is expanding their connectivity services to rural uh, parks um, with connectivity challenges. Um, the Department of Food and Ag is uh, you know, surveying the network of fairs to learn about broadband capabilities and deficiencies, um, as we've heard about um, earlier today. And then the Department of um, Motor Vehicles is expanding their services online, including senior services via voice-assisted um, technologies. Next slide. Um, so the next steps on, on this item is uh, our staff is gonna continue to do targeted outreach to um, attempt to get more responses and idea of where agencies and departments are. Um, uh, we intend to, to pull those together and report out results at the Broadband Council meeting in October. And then we anticipate given the broad nature of this action item that we'll further refine it. Um, uh, and probably recommend some revisions in the annual uh, action plan revision process at the end of the year. And that concludes my uh, updates on these four items. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Adams. Do any of the council members have questions for uh, Scott? All right, I see none. Thank you very much. Appreciate it, Mr. Adams. I know you have uh, additional updates uh, later on uh, throughout the presentation or uh, throughout the, uh, the morning. So good to see you. Uh, our final action item update before we go to general session um, and general updates is from the Governor's Office of Business and Economic Development. It is Ms. Kena Perina. Uh, good morning and thank you for the opportunity to present on action item number 23. Uh, which directs GOBIS to form a planning group of all state agencies that oversee any potential infrastructure or broadband uh, deploy adoption funding. To date, we have opened up additional cap capacity on our team to enable this and other action plan items under GOBIS's charge. While our focus up to this point was standing up permitting and funding opportunities, this next deliverable will continue to expand on these efforts by including new programming elements that were included in the state budget and federal infrastructure programs previously developed and those that are continuing to be rolled out. As we continue to build out the Community Economic Resilience Fund and additional programming from this and last budget cycle, we will convene appropriate agency partners to align the design, implementation, and delivery of these programs in a transparent and consistent manner. This will allow for increased likelihood of our ability to leverage state funds against upcoming federal investments. Additionally, we aim to continue to push for further engagement with our federal partners and the state agencies on program development. The governor recently appointed a new senior advisor for social innovation, and we look forward to working with them to highlight opportunities available within the philanthropic funding area. Each of our action items continues to progress, and we're excited to deliver actions that will enable increases to broadband deployment, increased transparency and opportunity in the process from the local level, as well as increased capacity for delivery and technical assistance. 
As this momentum continues and our new programs come online, we're eager to work with all of our communities via our community-based solutions team on delivering the tools and resources our jurisdictions need to meet the moment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Pereira. Any questions regarding action item number two for Kena? All right, I see none. Thank you very much. All right, we will go to Mr. Moreau, who will provide a middle mile update. Mr. Moreau. All right, good morning, uh, committee members. Mark Monroe, Deputy Director for the Middle Mile Broadband Initiative. Happy to provide an update on this project. Uh, as everyone is aware, the federal funding for this project comes with tight 2024 and 2026 completion deadlines. So it's really important that, um, that month to month we are making um, significant progress We'll start today with a quick recap um, of kind of what's happened since we last spoke. Um, we, uh, to start with, I think um, hopefully folks have been tracking, we signed um, uh, procurement contracts for fiber and related materials um, uh, in, um, in May. Uh, this is to secure roughly uh, or 3,000 miles or more of fiber and conduit and vaults and all of the things that we'll need over the life of the project um, and really intended to get ahead of the line in terms of any uh, supply chain issues or material shortages uh, between now and 2026. Um, similarly, we have uh, provided a 10,000 mile um, MMBI network map. Um, this is, the, this is the, the, the final initial map of where, the, uh, where along the state highway system we would uh, build to get to the unserved and underserved communities. It, it combines uh, approaches and methodologies uh, and analysis used by the Public Utilities Commission and Golden State Net um, and uh, to, to reach as many uh, unserved and underserved communities as, uh, as possible. And it allows Caltrans to start its pre-construction process for the entire network to move towards updated cost estimates and construction mobilization uh, to, as, we, as we head towards these 2024 and 2026 deadlines. Um, we're now, now that we've kind of come out with a lot of this initial planning and, and we're moving into this execution phase. Um, so as I noted, uh, you know, in addition to Caltrans working on the, uh, on its pre-construction work uh, to, to prepare this 10,000 miles, uh, Caltrans has also been looking for dig smart opportunities. Uh, these are identified as transportation projects where Caltrans is gonna be in the ground anyway. And so to the extent that fiber or conduit or any components of this project can be added, um, it's, a, it's a good efficiency and a smart use of funds. So um, Caltrans, we'll be talking a bit about some, some of what Caltrans has done on that front so far. Uh, Golden State Net, our third party administrator is continuing to explore lease options for segments that the state ultimately uh, decides that it can't afford to build. Um, and then we're looking at how, how we best um, optimize uh, or build, a, build and lease options statewide to, to really optimize statewide network uh, coverage. Um, I also want to note that um, the 2022 budget uh, package provided an additional $550 million in, in funding for the MMBI project, uh, bringing the total to $3.8 billion. Uh, these are out-year funds, out-year general funds, but um, they will help, help fund a greater amount of construction on the network and will help address other cost pressures uh, you know, caused by inflation and increased demand for labor equipment and materials. We'll go on to the next slide. So as I mentioned uh, earlier, the, uh, the, dig, the dig smart opportunities. So uh, as, as we all know, Caltrans has, uh, is constantly doing hundreds of projects, transportation projects throughout the state. And so um, these tend to take longer. And so not, not every project will lend itself to, uh, to adding fiber to it. Um, so in a way that would uh, that will tie to the federal timeframes. Uh, but um, they have so far been, uh, addressed or looked at 89 different um, projects. Uh, they are, they've identified 10 uh, where uh, transportation projects that will be started in, in the current calendar year, uh, where they'll be able to add fiber or conduit to them and they're evaluating another 79. So uh, you can see in the map here where the initial 18 projects were, we'll talk a little more about those in the future or you know, a little later here, but um, as you can see some of the red points where uh, where these, you know, these projects are located. Next slide. So um, one of the big challenges um, that anybody who's done construction um, in, in California knows about is the, uh, 
you know, the CEQA and the NEPA um, concerns and all of the, as well as all the other uh, dependent permitting. Um, and so we have um, th this, what you're looking at here really is the time frame. Uh, it's kind of an average time frame that Caltrans estimates uh, this, um, this, all of the permitting would have taken um, under normal circumstances, about 30 months on average. Um, and this is important because if we go to the next slide, uh, we can see that um, we can see that, that that's short been shortened here largely to um, by about 13 months to 17 months. Um, SB 156 provided CEQA streamlining that really makes things go uh, um, faster. Uh, and, 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 and you can see the dependencies down there for some of the other permitting, state permitting agencies um, that uh, all of that work can start earlier. So um, given the, the fact that we need to be um, under construction and have all our construction contracts signed in the next uh, two and a half years, this is really important information. Similarly, we can look at the federal, um, the, the federal permitting agencies. We have, um, uh, you can see that the Caltrans has historically had NEPA delegation uh, which really um, you can see how much faster that makes the NEPA process. And so um, there's some, some uh, highways that go through federal land like uh, uh, BLM land uh, where we're still working on how, how that's going to work out. That is uh, generally a longer time frame, but you can see for most of the work, there's again, substantial shortening uh, by um, the FHWA applying NEPA delegation, which used to apply just to transportation projects, but expanding it to, to apply also to broadband projects. So um, really happy about the progress we're making there. But again, all of this pre-construction work has to be done before we can actually go in the ground for any given segment and, and, and go to construction. So um, this is something that, that CDT is really focused on and, and, and working with Caltrans. Uh, you want to go to the next slide? Uh, real briefly, I think, um, you know, in the past, we've talked about the 18 initial projects that we announced last uh, um, November. Um, you know, per SB 156, all the projects had to have been identified as, you know, needs or, or solving for problems identified by the Public Utilities Commission. And these 18 had already been identified even by the Public Utilities Commission ahead of their broader assessment as uh, meeting um, solutions. Um, so uh, we, we started looking at these. I'm sorry. One second. All right, got some other noise in my background here. Um, the pleasures of working from home. Um, so um, in terms of the, uh, these initial 18 projects, uh, the, uh, um, you know, the, 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 the idea really was to get started and, and get learning on, on that pre-construction process. And so we're exploring um, leasing, we're exploring building, we're um, looking at uh, se sections that are going to be in, uh, in tribal areas or urban and rural communities, um, and we're looking at a range of geographical locations. Um, and so uh, within some of these, you have some of these uh, dig smart opportunities, um, a lot of, but also a lot of standalone, and the Golden State Net has gone through and done some assessment that we presented previously regarding potential uh, leases that would help um, provide connectivity to these 18. Uh, next section. So I'm um, kind of going back and tying those 18 to the uh, uh, to that pre-construction process. You can kind of see a summary in the middle here of the permitting time frame we just discussed. Uh, the permitting is obviously part of a broader, uh, we'll call it design, but it's really the whole pre-construction work that Caltrans has to do uh, before it can actually go on the ground. Um, and so um, lining that up, you can kind of see some of the percentages there and the various statuses of the, the 18 projects. So. Uh, some of them are in uh, more challenging areas, and um, and so they're still working out some of the details on how to do that. And some of the others have been able to make some more progress. Um, and and in the months and, and quarters to come, we'll see a lot of this get caught up um, and and kind of move forward. And so really, the the path that we see here for the initial eighteen is what's now being followed with the broader ten thousand miles. Uh, next slide. So, um, looking into the the, the months ahead here. Um, we're um, looking at the, the broader uh, program. Um, we are working on a, a vendor, uh, vendor briefing um, sessions on labor market uh, for construction. We just, brief, we just recently had a, a, a started one of two uh, contractor forums to really go out there and, and find out what the best approaches to construction are and how best to uh, make sure we have the best access to labor and equipment. Uh, similarly, we are in the process of working on a, a market sounding to identify where lit service and dark fiber uh, service uh, leases 
um, would be needed to make sure that to the extent that we have the fiscal, the, the financial flexibility to do so, we can design, we can optimize the design of the network. I mean, then we're also working with Golden State Net on a business plan for ongoing maintenance and operation. So that's uh, that's the uh, kind of the summary of my, my presentation today. Thank you, Mr. Moreau. Does any of the council members have questions um, for Mark? All right, I see none. Excellent presentation, thank you. Mr. Moreau, we'll go ahead and, and shift to the next agenda item. We are uh, lucky enough, well, Commissioner Hawk will be providing a last mile update. Commissioner. So thank you um, again, Darcy Hawk with the California Public Utilities Commission. And I'm gonna be providing the update on our um, CPUC last mile broadband initiatives. And I'll ask for a little bit of patience and bear with me as uh, some of the information I'm gonna provide may overlap with um, some of the comments that were recently provided by um, Director Osborne a little bit earlier this morning. Um, so thank you. So um, this slide provides a snapshot or an overview of um, our activities to implement the last mile broadband initiative programs. On the left, we have our local agency technical assistance program, which will provide support to local agencies and tribes for pre-construction costs for broadband network deployment. And I'll be talking about this program and some recent updates in more detail a little bit later in the presentation. Next, we have the Loan Loss Reserve Fund with $750 million allocated to help local agencies, tribes, and nonprofits finance broadband network deployment projects. As we've mentioned at previous um, broadband council meetings, we intend to issue a staff proposal um, very soon in August. Um, so we hope that you will engage um, in our CASF rulemaking to provide comment on the staff proposal and help us create a program that suits the needs of those it's intended to assist. Um, we need to have the federal, um, next on the chart is the federal funding account. Um, we adopted program rules last this last April. The federal funding account um, will award grants to fund last mile broadband infrastructure projects in every county. And we are developing priority areas and we'll be publicly releasing those areas prior to accepting applications. And then finally, the last um, column, we have our CISF programs, which include our infrastructure account, adoption account, public housing account, and consortia account. And I'll be providing some updates on these programs a little bit later in the presentation and giving some more detail on some of um, the grant application um, numbers and amounts. Uh, next slide, please. So our local um, technical assistance grants, um, the CPUC established a $50 million grant program to provide local agencies and tribal entities with grants of up to $1 million to help plan for broadband infrastructure projects to serve their communities. A broad range of local agencies are eligible and grant funds can be used to form joint powers authorities and co-ops. There's a wide range of activities that are eligible for funding through this program, including environmental, feasibility and engineering design studies, needs assessments, and broadband plans. We included this program in our updates today because we have some recent update activities and I'm good, I think it's worth repeating even though I know it was mentioned a little bit earlier, but our website, um, we posted a grantee manual. We have recorded webinars on the grant rules and the grant application, uh, another recorded webinar, including a detailed walkthrough of the grant program process will be posted on our website over the next week. We will be hosting a live webinar on August 2nd. Um, again, that'll be next week to provide further information. And uh, most importantly, I'm very happy to announce that we will begin accepting applications on August 1st um, next week. Our staff has done just a tremendous job of getting the new program up and running. There's lots of information and we encourage you to check that information out. We're very excited to launch the grant program and to work with all the local agencies and tribes on their broadband projects. And we've been doing some pre-meetings with um, different communities, uh, local and tribal governments. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so this is, uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the California Advanced Services Fund applications that we've recently received. 
First, um, I want to note that we recently received comments on a staff proposal to modify the rules of the CASF broadband infrastructure grant account. We anticipate a proposed decision on these rule changes to be issued in one of our August meetings. Um, parties have an opportunity to provide additional comments on that proposed decision um, before the Commission votes it out. And in regards to our um, remaining CASF programs, we had three grant opportunities open in July. The Broadband Adoption Grant Fund projects uh, funds projects by public entities and community-based organizations to promote digital literacy and broadband access. The grants to consortia help regional organizations to develop broadband projects and complete the grant application process. And the third opportunity was for grants to build broadband networks offering free broadband services for residents of publicly supported housing communities and farm worker housing communities. In total, the CPUC received 118 applications requesting a, a total of um, nearly $30 million. We received applications for 19 projects in the public housing facility for the public housing facilities for a total of 1.4 million. We received 99 applications for adoption activities for a total of 28.5 million. The adoption account applications can be summarized um, as follows. There were 88 applications for digital literacy projects, which represents $22.8 million six applications to fund call center projects seeking a total of $5.2 million, and five applications to fund broadband access seeking a total of a half a million dollars. The Rural and Urban Regional Consortia Account grant window closed on July 15th. We received 15 applications, 13 of which are from existing consortia, requesting additional funds to continue operations. And the remaining two applications are from areas currently not represented by broadband consortia and our staff are currently reviewing these applications. And there's more information on these grant opportunities available on our um, public web pages. And um, we can provide that link and there's contacts for the grant programs. Um, if you need more information, you can email statewide broadband all one word at cpuc.ca.gov and then next slide so i just wanted to also provide a brief update on some recent outreach um, with local agencies and tribes that um, was conducted in coordination with rcrc my advisor eileen odell and i um, did a trip through the eastern sierras at the end of july um, and you know, it was you know just before the Washburn and Oak fires that that broke out. We were at Yosemite National Park, met with park um, folks regarding broadband issues there. We also met with Mariposa County um, Supervisor Rosemary Smallcomb, and um, we learned a lot about the communications challenges for Mariposa County and Yosemite National Park. We also met with um, staff and representatives. Um, traveled to. Mono County, Inyo County, um, and Alpine County, and met with the Bishop um, Paiute tribe. Um, these were all separate visits um, that we conducted. And then since the last broadband meeting, we've also had um, separate consultations and met with the Yurok tribe and the Klamath tribe um, regarding broadband issues. So while we've known that many rural parts of California continue to be unserved by internet service providers and cell providers, these visits really hammered home for me and uh, my staff, how truly isolated some of these communities are without access or having limited access to broadband. For example, in Alpine County, um, their county building serves as an emergency shelter but has no internet connectivity. Um, in Yosemite National Park, we learned that they're struggling with communications resiliency. And um, this has also led to difficulty in attracting employees because the internet service is um, very poor to non-existent in, in the employee housing. Um, attending school virtually was extremely difficult, if not impossible, for um, some of the children in these communities during the pandemic. We also learned that, um, that California Fish and Game has moved to sale of fishing licenses and hunting licenses online through QRS codes. And if there's no service in the area, um, people visiting or um, 
vacation in any, in these areas may have to travel long distances to, to acquire their licenses, um, which affects economic development. Um, so again, I just wanted to give an update on some of the outreach we've done. I was truly impressed by the dedication and ingenuity of the public servants we met with who are facing challenges in areas such as public health and safety, economic development, and education opportunities for their communities with a lack of or um, limited broadband services. And I'm looking forward to continuing our work supporting network development in underserved and um, unserved areas and hope to continue visiting um, with various local and tribal communities throughout the state and um, continue to coordinate with CDT in these efforts for outreach. So that will conclude my comments on our last mile update. Thank you, Commissioner Houck. Um, very, it, it was nice that you actually personalized and under you know your visits sound like they're worthwhile. Sometimes when we walk a mile in other people's shoes, we understand the importance of this endeavor. So thank you very much. And do any of the other council members have questions for the commissioner about her presentation? All right, Ms. Wright, McPeak, do you have a question? No, I don't. <laughs> All right. All right. With that, thank you very much. Um, Commissioner, we'll go ahead and go on to the next agenda item, uh, which is actually Ms. Uh, Sunny Wright McPeak, who will provide a broadband adoption update. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. May I just also thank Commissioner Hope for the focus on broadband adoption. So if we'll go on to the next uh, slide, please. I'm going to provide an update on three items, ACP enrollment, report on investor-owned utility leadership to promote adoption, and on ACP mobilization statewide under the banner of Get Connected California. Next slide. So here is what you heard from uh, Deputy Director Adams. Uh, Scott presented this very good news of uh, what is uh, an, a very useful tool on the website of the California Department of Technology. Last week, uh, the White House made a, an announcement about the number of enrollments nationwide. Uh, Vice President Harris uh, focused on California as the state that has the most enrollments in the nation. 1.6 million California households have enrolled. We have about 5.8 million households who are eligible for the Affordable Connectivity Program or ACP. Uh, Scott showed you the enrollment tracker on the website. You can easily query it around where are we today with the latest data from the Federal Communications Commission Universal Services Administration Company. And I do wanna acknowledge that CSU Chico um, the North State Collaborative does an amazing job of immediately updating as soon as the FCC data is available. Next slide. Here is just uh, the summary for everyone. As uh, we, I think all know, there are about 13 million households in California. 45% of those households, 5.8 million, are eligible for the Affordable Connectivity Program. And as I just said, 1.6 million have signed up. That's 28% of those who are eligible. And we had set a goal in March of reaching at least uh, 5 million of households uh, in the next uh, four or five years, which puts us at about 32% of that original goal. Um, California remains around 12.37 or 4% of the nationwide enrollments. And you can see here that the majority still uh, remain mobile enrollments. Um, then there's, if you will, landline or fixed mobile, excuse me, fixed broadband into the home that's around 40%. And we have less than 1% that's wireless or satellite. The um, uh, issue that really we wanna flag is that low income households need to have generally both a mobile device, and especially if their children going to school, another permanent connection in the home. So we wanna continue to track this uh, proportional share of what the enrollments are of mobile versus in-home service. 
Uh, we also can see from the data that there is a direct correlation between promotion and signups. So if there's advertising, if there's activity, if there's distribution of information as there was by Los Angeles County in December, enrollments go up immediately. We see on the website, Internet for All Now and on Everyone On, uh, also immediate uh, activity as soon as there is some awareness, some promotion that reaches uh, the, the eligible households. Next slide. I'm now going to report on a piece of this work being done by the investor owned utilities and uh, thank my colleague Debbie Shireman, who is organizing and working with all of the four large investor owned utilities. And I want to compliment you see the names of the 10 people from the four IOUs who are doing tremendous work in reaching out to their low income customers and their customers who are already enrolled in. Uh, their um, rate subsidy programs. Next slide. The IOUs have identified four key strategies and are now persisting in implementing them. So the first is to have a telephone number and a link to the company websites on their website. Um, the second is to provide the message about the discounted uh, uh, broadband rates in all of their information around their discounted energy programs. The next is to include flyers about affordable broadband, ACP now, in the education kit, kits that go to low-income households for home repairs. And the last is to work with uh, CETF on training their community-based organizations who do the outreach for their energy programs uh, to also have information around ACP and to be able to inform their customers uh, and the low income households they're working with about this opportunity. Uh, to date, three of the four IOUs have arranged the briefings for their CBOs and 140 CBOs have been trained. Overall, the IOUs have a goal of reaching 4 million customers um, on their care uh, program with this information about ACP. And on the next slide, you will see that there's already been uh, a collection of activities of those four strategies that have resulted in um, 1.9 uh, million plus completed activities for those four strategies. So again, I wanna do a great uh, thank you to the investor owned utilities and those 10 leaders on getting all of this work done that's adding to our mobilization, which leads to the next slide, uh, which is, oh, I wanna show you, um, there, are, there are examples of what the IOUs have on their website. So this is one, and on the next one, you'll see three more that are uh, amazing information that the IOUs have all had to do this, this work around. And this leads into and complements on the next slide, the mobilization that, uh, really is coming about because state agencies have coalesced uh, to coordinate activities under the banner, Get Connected California. Uh, the organizing partners are the Department of Technology. Uh, so thank you to Scott and his team, the California Department of Education. So uh, really Jeff Bellow has uh, identified this with Superintendent Thurman to target particularly this next coming month, August, because that's when kids are going back to school. The California State Association of Counties. Uh, so Jeff Neal and Farrah Ting and um, Brian Cote have been wonderful in working with also the State Library. Uh, thank you, Josh Chisholm, and then working with CETF. Um, we have uh, this collection of effort because 90% of all of the households who are eligible for ACP are also enrolled in Medi-Cal, CalFresh, administered by counties, and the National School Lunch Program, obviously administered through the schools. Uh, we're also working, I should uh, add, with higher education, all three systems, because the Pell Grant is another category for automatic, um, automatic enrollment in ACP. The first month of focus, it won't be the last in this fiscal year, but the first 
month, again, identified by CDE is this coming month, Monday, because this is the time that kids are going back to school. And we really want our uh, students who are qualified for the National School Lunch Program and their parents to know about ACP. We also realize that if there's no broadband at home, yet you have to enroll in ACP online, that some households are gonna need assistance, they're gonna need a place to go. And so the California Department of Education has targeted Saturday, August 27th for on-site uh, assistance. We are currently identifying those host sites, uh, recruiting uh, volunteers and staff, uh, organizing for our community-based organizations to be able to take calls and internet service providers are also joining in this entire effort. I also want to compliment and thank my colleague, Marissa Canche and uh, Charles Gardner for coordinating and staffing this working group at the state level. And I want to welcome any other state agency who wants to join. And lastly, going to the next slide. Uh, these are links uh, to really important information. The first is that the California Department of Education secured from the FCC the approved verification letter to make it as easy as possible for a household qualified for the National School Lunch Program to take that document and be able to submit it to enroll in ACP. And then there is going to be a toolkit that anybody can use for your own mobilization, where you can take flyers and add your own logos, you can customize, uh, you're able to access ads, you can also customize, and there'll be other information to um, mobilize in August as the first month this fiscal year and to work on the 27th. And then in summary on the last slide, we just wanna thank everybody that we have uh, made the progress to date of 1.6 million households enrolled. We want to accelerate that progress to meet the goals of the California Broadband Council. We commend the IOUs and ask um, even more assistance during this fiscal year to accelerate enrollment. And uh, we invite everybody to be involved in this um, ACP mobilization, Get Connected California, especially in August. Um, we have the uh, housing authorities, counties, cities are being uh, getting involved, regional broadband consortia, the metropolitan planning organizations, particularly Sandag and Skag are doing a tremendous amount of job and the internet service providers are joining us. So thank you, Chair. Um, I'll return this back to you. Thank you, Ms. Wright McPeak for um, you know, the adoption uh, update. I, I think that's really where the rubber hits the road, road where you make a difference in the lives of, of residents. And so it, it's, it shows the importance that this uh, council makes um, across the state. And so it was very rewarding to, to hear your update. Um, I will uh, open it up to um, comments from the council members. Does anybody have questions for Sunny? All right, I don't see any. Thank you again, Ms. Wright McPeak. Always You're a pleasure. Uh, our last presentation before public comment is the National Telecommunications and Information Administration Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act update. Uh, a mouthful. Um, that's why we have two presenters today to go over that. That is Mr. Scott Adams and Mr. Rob Osborne. Um, th thank you again, Director Bailey Cremins. Um, and, um, Council members and members of the public, um, you know, I know this has been a long agenda, and we can see uh, how comprehensive this state's broadband for all uh, program and various various initiatives are, and how they all are interdependent and fit together. One of the things that we've been um, doing at each of the meetings this year is to um, inform council members of the status of the NTIA IIJA programs um, to the extent that they represent significant funding to support. Um, you know, the Broadband for All initiatives that are currently in place and to expand on those. Um, so I'm happy to be here with Rob to uh, Osborne from PUC to provide a quick update. Next slide, please. 
Um, wanted to share that uh, two of the, the big programs through the uh, NTIA's IJ programs are the um, digital equity planning and BEAD programs. And so, as we mentioned at the top of the meeting here, the Department of Technology has uh, submitted a, a digital equity planning grant um, application to the NTIA earlier, um, earlier this month. The CPUC has submitted the broadband equity access and deployment um, letter of intent to be the administering entity, um, uh, you know, and do the, the five-year plan for that and, and receive the funding. Um, both of these um, efforts will require the development of plans over the next year, um, which CDT and, and PUC will be coordinating um, over the next year. And it will require, um, you know, participation and contributions from broadband council members and other stakeholders. Um, once the uh, plans associated with these are completed at the end of the year and approved by NTIA, um, these will unlock potentially billions of additional federal dollars that can help support the state broadband for all efforts that um, you've heard about, um, you know, in today's agenda and, and even, you know, go further beyond that. Next slide, please. I wanted to provide a, a brief update and, and to clarify that um, what the state has submitted on digital equity is um, an application to receive um, planning funds to develop and expand the state's digital equity plan. Um, and, um, you know, we anticipate the state's done a, a, a lot of work on digital equity and, and many of the components discussed today represent, um, you know, in essence, a digital equity plan. But um, the funds we will receive and the, the efforts we'll be able to um, undertake over the next year will help us really expand, do a gap analysis, um, you know, and identify, you know, uh, needs and resources um, to support digital equity um, throughout the state. I wanted to share with you that some of the measurable objectives that the NTIA has laid out for um, the digital equity plan are really identifying access to fixed and wireless broadband, um, you know, uh, fostering online accessibility and inclusivity of public resources, um, fostering and promoting digital literacy, um, <coughs> the raising awareness and use of measures to secure online privacy and cybersecurity, and then um, really supporting and power access to devices and technical support. Um, you know, some of the outcomes that the digital equity planning process calls out is really fostering and facilitating um, you know, educational outcomes, economic and workforce development, um, access to, to healthcare and healthcare services, civic and social engagement, and delivery of social services. Next page, please. Um, as I mentioned at the top, this is, um, you know, uh, both the value of um, the state and the state partners, and also um, something embedded in the, um, the infrastructure legislation and the NTIA's NOFOs is that partnership and, and collaboration is critically important to states in developing their plans um, and really requires meaningful engagement that prioritizes eight covered populations. Um, on the left-hand side of this, you will see that um, the eight covered populations are low-income individuals, aging individuals, incarcerated individuals, veterans, individuals with disabilities, members of racial and ethnic minority groups, individuals residing in rural areas, and individuals with literacy barriers, including those <coughs> who are uh, English learners and have low levels of literacy. Um, additionally, there's a specific requirement um, that there be extensive um, engagement with um, tribal governments and entities. So, um, you know, coordinated outreach and, and collaboration on strategy with tribes, um, inventorying of existing uh, resources and programs, and then alignment of um, the state digital equity plan with tribal digital equity plans. And one thing that I've noted we already got started on is uh, earlier this month, we did do a, a technical assistance workshop with tribal entities to make sure that they were able or aware of and able to submit letter of intents to receive separate um, funding allocations from NTIA to develop their um, digital equity plans um, in coordination with the state's uh, overarching plan. Next slide. Um, just real uh, 
briefly wanted to give you an update on the timeline. Um, so the deadline for the planning grant application was July 12th. We submitted the application on July 11th. Um, there's currently an application review process. Um, we uh, expect that the planning grant funds will be received by the state sometime in late September, early October. There will be, um, you know, the state will have one year um, from the receipt of the award to um, develop the state digital equity plan. And then once that um, plan is completed, it needs to be submitted to the um, NTIA and approved, and then that will um, enable the state to unlock um, another pool of funding for capacity and implementation grants. Um, and so uh, I know Rob uh, Osborne from PUC would like to share some information about BEAT. I'm gonna hand over the floor to him. Thank you, Scott. Um, so just as a, a recap, the broadband equity access and deployment program has 42.45 billion available nationwide. We expect California will be eligible for one of the largest percentages of that money dependent upon the number of eligible locations. So the plan, well, the rules state that initially 100 million is allocated to each state and, and uh, jurisdiction, and then, well, actually not jurisdiction. So for instance, Washington, DC. And then on top of that, there's a location-based allocation. So the bead funds are intended for broadband planning, deployment, multi-tenant building deployment, adoption in digital equity and workforce development. The last mile prioritization uh, goes in the order of providing broadband to unserved first off, and then underserved, and then finally to anchor institutions in that order. The bead grants, so um, the, the, the money will be uh, allocated to California and then the PC would have a subgrantee uh, program similar to what we have in place already for the federal funding account for, and this would be separate for bead. The bead grants require a minimum of 25% matching funds. So as Scott mentioned, um, the, we submitted the letter of intent uh, with a request for $5 million in initial planning funds to the NTIA for bead. And so the next step uh, on that is the bead initial planning funds application, which is due before August 15th. And um, that will cover the expenses required to create what's called the BEAD five-year action plan. And that five-year action plan is due 270 days, within 270 days. Um, the CPC intends to use the initial planning funds to create a comprehensive five-year action plan that will identify California's broadband needs and lay out how and when BEAD funding, which requires matching funds, as I said earlier, is most appropriate in the context of the other state and federally funded programs that we have. So specifically CSF, federal funding account, low loss reserve, um, local agency technical assistance. Other initial planning activities uh, will include public and stakeholder outreach, training and education, and planning for workforce development. Next slide, please. So I apologize, this slide is rather complex and detailed, but I'm just gonna touch upon some highlights. Um, so after the uh, initial planning funds are awarded and the five-year action plan is approved, the PUC will be submitting the BEAD initial proposal, which is due 180 days after the notice of funding amount is issued. So we would be notified of our allocation for the state. And then we have 180 days to put forth a BEAD initial proposal. And that once that is approved, 20% um, up to 20% of funding will be made available. Following that, there's a final proposal, which will then, uh, once that is approved, release the remaining amount up to 80% of the funding. And that final proposal is due 365 days after approval of the initial proposal. As Scott said, the California Department of Technology is a state entity tasked with creating the digital equity plan. And the PC is in close coordination with CDT and putting together a holistic and effective set of IIJ plans, meaning digital equity and BEAD, that not only meet the NTIA's requirements, but also maximize the use of IIJA funds by leveraging existing initiatives and programs. So we're really in a, a pretty strong position with regard to uh, other states, um, thanks to the hard work of the governor with the executive order N7320 
and the Broadband Council with the Broadband Action Plan that we put together at the end of 2020 and the various broadband funding initiatives that were introduced or extended last year, California is well positioned to take full advantage of the BEAD and the Digital Equity Funds. One example, just before I end, is the cost modeling and GIS work we've been doing and how we're integrating those tools into the grant making process to ensure the optimal and equitable use of precious state and federal resources to bring broadband to all Californians. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Adams, and thank you, Mr. Osborne. Do any of the council members have questions for either Scott or Rob? All right, I see none. Thank you very much for your presentation. We'll go ahead and move on to public comment. Ms. Stein, will you please provide the public comment guidelines and begin the public comment process? Sure. In order to ensure that everybody who wishes to make public comment has the opportunity to do so, we respectfully request one speaker per entity and two minutes per speaker. We'll go in order of online submissions received before the meeting. Zoom and then online submissions that were received after the meeting began. Please raise your Zoom hand if you'd like to make a public comment. If you are calling, if you are attending via phone, please press star nine to raise your Zoom hand. And also before we get the question, we will be posting video and slides to the website, uh, most likely within the next week. We're not seeing any hands, so what I'm going to do is go ahead and go to the two um, online submissions that happened after the meeting began. One is from Katie Hydorn. Um, I don't I know I saw her here. And I will go ahead and unmute you. Good morning, everyone, and happy Friday. Katie Hydorn, Executive Director, Ensure the Uninsured Project. Um, thank you all for the wonderful presentation today. Um, really appreciate how you organized this and walked through everything. So thank you for that um, and, and appreciate all of the work that's going on. A um, couple comments that I think were, were quite specific um, that I wrote down. Um, uh, just a couple questions on, I heard someone talking about um, using state prisons as part of the network. And I was just curious if the California Health and Human Services facilities are also being considered, the developmental centers and the state hospitals. Um, a lot of our work is focused around making sure that anything possible that could be an anchor institution in under-resourced communities are considered. And so just wanted to, to submit that. Um, and then the other piece, I'm so excited about um, Ms. Wright McPeak's presentation around Get Connected, looking forward to continuing the work that we're doing on ACP promotion, um, but just wanted to note that um, there are huge amounts of folks enrolled in um, the Medi-Cal program, in the Women, Infants, and Children's program, um, which are under the jurisdictions of departments in Cal HHS, um, and would love to see those um, considered uh, for maybe not this one. I know that the, the train is moving um, on August and so excited for that promotion right as school's coming back in session. But as you do additional rounds of the Get Connected program, please consider the Health and Human Services programs as well. Thank you so much. Uh, Madam Chair, I might, I wanna just comment. Thank you, Katie, for your leadership. And uh, I know that the California Department of Technology is working through the process to actually formally request HHS involvement, but so is the California State Association of Counties. And you have great working relationships. So please reinforce that message, let's engage. I think you're absolutely right. And of course, your work on uh, insure, uh, the uninsured and uh, being able to uh, either make aware or engage all of those healthcare facilities and locations to promote ACP would be welcome. So um, help us, Katie, you are such a, an amazing leader and uh, we need everybody uh, just to come together uh, as soon as possible. Thank you. Um, the next person who submitted an um, online public comment is Cesar Estrada. Mr. Estrada, if you are in attendance, could you please raise your hand? I'm not seeing any hands. Um, is there anybody else who'd like to make public comment? It appears that nobody is raising their hand, Madam Chair. All right, thank you, Ms. Dial, uh, Stein. Um, are there any other council members who would like to make additional comments before we close the meeting?
All right, I see any. I see, oh, yes, Miss Wright, Miss, Miss Wright uh, McPeak. Madam sure, Chair, I think you'd be you'd be disappointed if I didn't make one last comment. But I I uh, and I apologize, but I do see um, that uh, Dr. Williams is here representing um, the assembly and Assemblymember Gibson. And I wanted to assure Angelo and also uh, Sarah Smith representing the Senate that a part of the Get Connected California, we're actually providing information out to all the legislators as well. So a number of legislators have asked about how they can be involved. And I, I simply wanted to acknowledge that we will be following through on, on uh, that opportunity as well. That's an excellent point. Thank you very much, Ms. Wright McPeak. Was there any other comments from any of the other council members or from the public? All right, I wanna thank the council members, presenters and attendees um, for their contribution today. I also wanna express my gratitude for those people who are working so diligently to move things forward. Your work is valued and it will make a great a contribution to advancing broadband for all. Our next meeting, as a reminder, is scheduled for October 12th. Um, because of the 22-23 the, um, uh, uh, budget, we are, because of Bagley Key, we have the, been given the opportunity to remain virtual um, through uh, July 2023. And so we will, um, be, these will be virtual unless otherwise posted. Uh, we look forward to seeing everyone then. And with that, we will be concluding the, um, the July California Broadband Council meeting.